Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have you all here with us this morning. Uh, as Ann said, I'm Ellen Futter, the president of the museum, and it is my very great pleasure to welcome all of you to the museum this morning as we preview our newest Hayden Planetarium space show, Dark Universe. In the past 13 years since we opened the Rose Center for Earth and Space and the new Hayden Planetarium right up there, millions and millions of visitors from around the world have come to this spectacular facility and been inspired, informed, enlightened, and utterly dazzled by our exhibits and space shows. But also during that time, scientific understanding of the universe and the technology by which we can study it have exploded. Like biology, astrophysics is in a period of tremendous activity and discovery right now, and this new space show brings our visitors to the very edge of what is known. Dark matter is that mysterious stuff, and dark energy the mysterious force that scientists now know make up the vast majority of the universe. And yet, it can't be seen. So what is it? How does it behave? How do scientists even discover it, and how do they study and observe it today? In this new space show, we will reveal this and much more. But at the root of all that we display, is the unquenchable and animating inquisitive spirit of humanity that drives us to figure it all out and to make continuous progress in doing so, bit by bit by bit. We are deeply grateful to our partners who have made this space show possible, including Accenture, sponsor of Dark Universe, and we're very pleased to have with us today Layla Worrell, Managing Director of the New York Office, and Roxanne Taylor, Chief Marketing and Communications Officer. Thank you so much for your support. <laughs> and for your continuous partnership in our space shows. And thanks also to support from Con Edison, and welcome to Hilary Ayala, Director in Grass of Grassroots Management and Strategic Partnerships. We're delighted you're here as well. And we, and we acknowledge the Charles Hayden Foundation, our planetarium's namesake, for its long-standing support of the planetarium and for major funding for Dark Universe. Creating something as complex and technical as Hayden Planetarium Space Shows takes a lot of hands and minds and we really do have a dream team on this project. An exceptionally talented and truly multidisciplinary group of scientists, educators, visualization experts, engineers, writer, composer, and others working together to make the story of dark matter and dark energy visible and accessible. And you'll be hearing more from some of them in just a moment. The end result is a true marriage of highly complex scientific data with the most sophisticated design and expertise and in interpretation, all made possible through advanced technology. If you think about it, the museum has long been a place where art and science have come together to teach and to inspire. The spectacular habitat dioramas just a short walk away our magnificent historic example of this, though still highly relevant and effective. For when art and science truly coalesce, our ability to approach and understand the world around us is expanded and deepened. And of course, since this is the Rose Center, we've added a dollop of thrill and wonder to the mix as we take you on a journey deep into the universe. Leonardo da Vinci, perhaps the original embodiment of art and science, wrote that a painter should begin every canvas with a wash of black, because all things in nature are dark, except we're exposed by light. And so in this show, Dark Universe, we shed light on the dark, which is, in a way, what this museum is all about. Of course, no expedition to space would be complete without a voice to guide us in the dark. And for that task, we have one of the premier illuminators and guides extant, the narrator of Dark Universe, our very own Neil deGrasse Tyson, Frederick P. Rose Director of the Hayden Planetarium and one of the greatest public communicators of science. He has written 10 books and was host of PBS's Nova Science Now for five seasons. Perhaps not since Carl Sagan, 
has a voice been so recognizable as a guide to the universe, which is fitting since next spring, Neil will be hosting a 21st century reboot of Carl Sagan's Cosmos TV series on Fox. I'm pleased now to turn the program over to Neil Tyson. Welcome to the universe. <laughs> I like to think of that. Uh, just to remind you, if it's your first time here, you're sitting underneath the sphere containing the Hayden Planetarium and it is properly supported above your head. Uh, my sister, uh, when we were growing up, we came here all the time, and one of the things that scared her was the whale suspended over your head. So it seems to be a thing we like to do to put you on edge. Uh, just, uh, I just want to make it clear that uh, we have a panel. I'm going to invite them up in just a moment. Other than attending like an early meeting on this space show, my only role was to narrate it. And so in order to flesh out what this occasion is for us together, we need to get into how all this sausage gets made. So let me right now bring up uh, the principles of the creation of dark universe and just all up together in a row here, Mordecai, Carter, Vivian, Tim and Robert, and as I address them individually, uh, I'll, you'll learn more about them as I unfold this conversation. Thank you, lady and gentlemen. Uh, so, like I said, all I did was narrate it. So, your, any thoughts you have, questions regarding the show, are going to come up to the five of them. And I take uh, host privileges by being the first to address them. Mordecai McLow, uh, my colleague in the Department of Astrophysics, is uh, chief curator of the show. And in the old days, uh, planetariums were just, I don't want to say just, but we would have four shows a year, one each season, and we'd show the stars of the night sky and then the voice of the director would guide you through them. And it's like really different now. And so what Tell me about the collaborations necessary and the, the creation of the, the themes that went into it. Okay. Well, what's different now is instead of sky shows looking out from the surface of the Earth into the universe, we have space shows. With digital technology, we've taken you off the surface of the Earth, out of the solar system, and into the universe. You are there. And this requires drawing on the tremendous amount of astronomical knowledge we've gathered over the last century. Here at the museum, we've developed the digital universe, which takes every three-dimensional position known to astronomers, from the Hipparchos satellite of the European Space Agency, from ground-based surveys like the uh, uh, Sloan survey, and puts them into our dome and gives you a joystick. We, there actually is a joystick up there, and you can fly around it. And that is the skeleton, the foundation of our shows. Then, to actually visualize the astronomical events and occurrences that we're bringing into the show, we go out and work with the best astrophysical simulators around the world and the best observers around the world. Whoever's doing the work, we go and tap on their shoulder. And one of the advantages of having a research department in astrophysics here at the museum is that these are our colleagues. These are not someone that we're, is a stranger to us. We know their work because, well, sometimes we're competing with them and we know they did a little better. <clears throat> um, so we know who's good and we can talk to them on an even stage. And so when we wanted to do simulations of dark matter, for example, we went to Tom Amabel at the Kabbalah Institute for Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology at Stanford, and he had the best model, and we've got the best visualization of it. Thank you, Carter. <laughs> uh, Tim, you've, uh, you're a writer of everything astronomical, and I remember your earliest books back in the 1970s. Uh, the Red Limit, I think, was one of them. Is that right? Yes. You're very first. And so, Tim, we're privileged in astrophysics to have people such as Tim who is professionally, he's like an English person. You were, you were professor of English at Brooklyn College long ago, is that, that right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> and so we have I'm proud some, of it. <laughs> and so we have people who not only, I mean, any one of us can write a, a wiki page article, but it takes another level of talent to actually put an idea to words in a way that really 
uh, works its way into your sort of heart and soul. So Tim, when you saw this topic and you were tasked with writing about it, what, was that hard? Was it easy? Was it just another gig? Well, I was grateful to have the opportunity because uh, I, got, I, I was exposed to science and came to realize what a great subject science is because of institutions like this one. When I was a kid, I would come to the Hayden Planetarium when visiting New York and uh, other cities. And I was always impressed by the fact that there were some adults who were willing to take the time to explain these things in a way that I could understand. And that impressed me more in a way than the content sometimes, just that there was a culture of handing down uh, science and, and the conceptions of the universe. You know, through history, uh, virtually every culture about which we have any information has found it important to ha have an account of what the universe is like and how it got to be here. Up until very recently, those accounts were imaginary. They were the best stories someone could think of because they didn't have the observational data to, to, um, to know the facts. Now we have a, a growing factual story of what nature is like on the large scale and what our common history of the, uh, this planet and this solar system and all the other stars and galaxies is. And I've always found that a fantastic subject to, to write about. We science writers are in the same, uh, same boat as the poets in one sense that you have to find exactly the right language to accurately represent something that's very technical. There'll always be some flaws. You know, Robert Frost said, uh, every metaphor is, Im is imperfect. That's the beauty of them. <laughs> uh, so that you, you try to make an array of metaphors. Otherwise, it's not a metaphor. It's the exact description. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then, so, so in a way, you're trying to turn the flaw in the metaphor, turn the vase around to the point that it's not relevant to the story that you're, you're telling. And so over the, the more than a year that, that I've been involved in this project, uh, it's, it's really been interesting to go back and forth about exactly what language will best serve what is, after all, of just speaking, our, as Americans, uh, our great art form, you know, science. That's, that's what we do best. Uh, I'd like to say that as I narrated the script, the, the words just spoke themselves out of my mouth. And so it was a, it was a trivial exercise to carry his words onto uh, recording. So I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Tim. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, Carter. Um, Carter Emart is a director of astrovisualization. We actually have such a title here. And in the history of Hayden Planetarium, we've always had the luxury, first, of being a, a producing entity. Most planetariums in the country do not have the resources to create their own product. They would buy it or rent it from other sources. We have the privilege of being able to create it. And over that legacy, We've always had in-house scientifically literate artists. And what, what, a, what, a, what a pleasure that is, because then you can speak to them and they can think about it in a way that you can't or you haven't or wouldn't have thought to and figure out a way to then bring that to the public. Carter transitioned us from the old-fashioned days where we would photograph uh, uh, canvas and put it up on the dome into the world of uh, the computer representation of our data. And so, Carter, what, what challenges did this, did representing something dark <laughs> have for you? Well, it's, actually, it's actually, you know, it, it follows along a, a legacy, obviously, of the, of the planetarium. In the traditional sense was the sky and seeing positions of planets and stars and so forth. But with the advent of a rebuild of this, really at the advent of the turn of the millennium, we, we had the ability to really full, fully display the science data on the dome continuously in a movie format. When that happened, that really opened the door to visualizing basically the three-dimensional layout of the universe and then the simulations of its behavior. And so in the case of getting a simulation, uh, such as dark universe, uh, such as dark matter, such as itself, uh, also, I'm uh, trying to illustrate the dark energy, the galaxy. Uh, these things all coming together as simulations. We're really sort of coloring by number. Uh, we're basically take the output from simulations, and we can turn those into the pictures. 
My well, it's more than that. We're, we're, you, you're, you're establishing trajectories through the data. You're not just coloring how pictures. To, well, how to a, a visualize true. it? Well, when, okay. <laughs> once you have it, once you have the layout there, then you can fly the camera interactively. A lot of the flight pads, uh, personally, I flew, and then I hand them over to my very exceptional technical directors, John Parker and Andreas Winterborn, sitting over there. Please stand up a second, you guys. More of the, more of the team. Yes, thank These you. These guys did a lot of the work. Mm -hmm. That's right. And, and so, that, uh, but this ability to fly through the universe is our ability to really sort of span it with our brains. This is, this is a new era where we can really sort of get into that data. And, and in that tradition, what the, what the planetarium becomes, it's always been a place where you can go in, give a simulation to the night sky. But just as you walk around this museum and you see the dioramas, uh, these are windows of nature with a glass wall you can't step inside. Upstairs is our portal to the closest thing I think we'll ever get to a, a real starship. And as the technology gets better and better, that immersive sense, and this represents the pinnacle of our abilities so far in this. So it's an attempt, and we hope you enjoy it today. But really, it's our way to sort of step beyond the glass, step into the tradition of what this place is, and really go with it. You, so you wanted to go into the dioramas. I didn't, because there were scary animals on the other side of the diorama, <laughs> having grown up here, keep them behind glass. Uh, Vi Vivian uh, Trikinsky, she was the director of science bulletins here at the museum, and it's a natural extension of those talents to become uh, basically uh, a producer, producer of the show. And most people don't think about the producer, they just see the final product and you sometimes just become invisible. And so tell me what you did to make yourself invisible. <laughs> so when a producer does her job well, she does become invisible. Uh -huh. um, basically, it's the producer's job, I think, to act as the glue in a production. As you can probably tell, there are a lot of very passionate, creative people working on this project. It's a giant story. We could have gone in a million directions. We have a limited time frame, a limited budget, and limited resources. So I think my most important job as producer on this was to try and get everybody on the same page, facilitate a common vision. There's a lot of iteration in these shows between script and visuals and music, you know, very particular science points that need to get in there, some science we would have liked to get in there that Mordecai just wasn't convinced about. Um, so a producer's job is really to, to keep the program moving forward. And occasionally I like to act as the dummy check so I don't have a science background except what I've learned here at the museum. So I could stand in for you guys and for the audience and say, I have no you idea what you're talking about You just called the audience a dummy, just, just by inference, just to... I meant them. it in the nicest possible way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Vivian, you said you're the glue, but sometimes that turns into a whip at times, is that correct? Never. <laughs> well, hardly ever. Yeah, we'll be the judge of that. Uh, Robert. What does space sound like? <laughs> you're, you're, you're a composer of everything that is composable. Uh, TV commercials, movie scores, and that's what you do. And, we'd then, and we now hand you the universe. What's the creative process there as composer of record for this project? Um, good morning, everybody. Well, you know, it's a very fascinating thing to talk about because I hear a lot of incredible information here at, at the museum, and it's, it's from, you know, folks like all of you. And it's very deep, and it's fascinating. But behind those facts is really something so fundamental that, that really unites every one of us. It's this very basic spirit of wonder. You know, what, what is it that really drives us to want to know what we, what we know and, and to perceive what we don't know? And that feeling is, is kind of like being a perpetual six-year-old who just stares up at the heavens. And that feeling is, is, is living within me, but I, I believe everyone in this room feels, feels very similar uh, feelings about, about the things that we wonder about. So my job really, in a sense, is to crystallize those feelings somehow in, in sound, to bring to life that sense of excitement, the sense of wonder, fascination, sometimes 
um, the idea that we're a little nervous or even a little terrified of some of the, the, the expansive ideas involving, um, you know, our search for knowing what we, what we don't know about the universe. Wait, so you have a portfolio of, okay, this, this musical phrase will be terrifying. This will be pleasing. This will be, I mean, th this is how you're thinking about it, right? You know, yeah, um, absolutely not. I, I believe that, um, that each time I, I've come to, to work on a score for, for all of us at the museum, I'm just trying to be an open book, and, and, and at times I'm on the nose, and I'm crystallizing something that seems like a, a direct musical communication for something that is mysterious, as, you, as you'll soon see. But um, often... It's, it's something much, much broader and somewhat more elusive to talk about. Um, but um, again, it's, it's about being able to br build this bridge, as Bernstein used to say, between the, the finite and the infinite. I'm trying to be part of that bridge for, for everybody. Is there a difference between looking at the visuals and thinking of what to compose and reading the script? and thinking of what to compose? Or do they come together as one force operating on you? They come together, there's no question about it, because the, the visual is also an inspiration from what's on the, on the written page, and uh, uh, I, do, I don't see any separation. In fact, when I, when I read a script, as I did first uh, from one of the first drafts from Tim, I'm already imagining something which may not be exactly what happens when we crystallize it in, in, you know, in, uh, on the dome um, with, with the great uh, talents of, of Carter and everybody involved, but, but I, I, I think that, in a sense, they are always um, you know, uh, one holistic, organic um, idea, and I, I don't see much separation. Carter, what was the hardest thing to visualize in this show? Dark energy. Dark energy, because we have no idea what it is, and we can't see it. We can measure it, but we don't actually know what it is, even though we can characterize it increasingly well. Yeah, it's, it, it was a challenge to, it, it's sort of the, the like of the invisible man, in a way. It's like the, the invisible man, you don't see him unless he's wrapped up in his, in his, uh, in his you know, clothing, bandages, and so forth. But uh, whereas dark matter is something that can be calculated, essentially, and we can get a visual of that. So you're referring so, to the original movie, the, the Invisible Man, where the clothes would come, he'd take his clothes off and then he'd be, and he'd just walk through walls and doors. But he would never fall through the floor into the basement. I never <laughs> understood that. I think he could walk through walls. But... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the challenge of representing that which is dark. And um, so, uh, Tim, do you have special vocabulary words for things we can't see? That's a good question. No, I don't have any special ones, although this, the show, it's, it's beginning to sound as if our emotional range is from unsettling to deeply unsettling. <laughs> um, With a little hint of triumph mixed in there. <laughs> yes. It's, it's, um, it is amazing that the, one of the great discoveries in cosmology has been uh, all of these new phenomena that are not understood. And... Um, Dark energy, uh, we, uh, we have no idea what it is, and yet you can virtually guarantee that there is a tremendous amount to be learned and that you know, whatever it is we don't know about the vacuum is going to be a major part of 21st century physics, assuming we can get to it in the 21st century. Yeah, Mord Mordecai, what does it mean to talk about something about which we know nothing, but we can measure it? Just, just give well, me some light on that. Yeah. So, one of the amazing, the really tremendous advances in cosmology over the last decade or two has been that we've gone from a very broad, general concept of, okay, the universe is expanding, but we don't really understand the details, to being able to measure the details to better than a few percent. This is what we call precision cosmology. And that is what has revealed some of the utterly strange unexpected things that we've discovered recently is these precision measurements. The devil is in the details. The devil is in the details and popped right out. And we have been forced into a very odd picture of the universe and we've been forced by repeated measurement independently done by multiple groups and that is the essence of science is being able to go out, measure something, have someone else go out and measure that, compare results. If it comes out the same, you know you're on to something. In this case, we're on to the universe is accelerating outwards and is full of stuff that we cannot actually directly 
measure, at least not yet. We may be getting close on dark matter. Vivian, uh, when, is it like herding cats bringing everyone together? I know I was one of those cats. I like cats, though. Okay. <laughs> uh, what I always wonder is there are all these pieces, and they have to come together and work as one coherent product. And yeah. I think that's something that, like, as we said earlier, when that's done perfectly, no one notices it. It's like if you mow your lawn perfectly, you don't get compliments for that. Or if a man shaves perfectly, no one comes up, hey, you did an awesome job shaving today. It's only when you don't that people complain. <laughs> so is there any aspect of this show that you, at this point, you think you might have done differently? In any place where you yes. messed up? <laughs> <laughs> no, we never messed up. Uh -huh. It's perfect. Um, there are definitely things I would have done differently. Um, this is the first time that I've produced one of these shows, so it was a huge learning curve for me. And, you know, I'm being very genuine when I say that I feel very lucky that I got to work with the team that I got to work with. But it's interesting. I'll take the, um, the example of dark energy. Carter says it was the, the most difficult scene to direct. Um, I think it was a very difficult scene to write. It's one of the scenes that came together really in the last weeks of production. And it's my favorite scene in the show. We went back and forth with how much is too much to say, what can we show, what would be too much at that stage in the production, how do we really, you know, wrap this invisible force in some clothing that would be compelling but not misleading. And I think that through all the work of the back and forth and the back and forth and the back and forth, everybody's ideas came together in a scene that is so compelling and very dramatic and really um, emotionally and dramatically speaks to the essence of not just dark energy, but of dark universe, of the, the entire nature of the show. I'd, so, like, I'd like to add that um, generally when you have great technology and great data sets, what you find yourself doing is what others had done before you, but just better or higher resolution or maybe a little more compellingly. And in the show that you will all be seeing in, shortly, uh, there are visualizations in there that I've just never seen before. Things that were not just better versions of what came before, they, as far as I can tell, are the only versions ever put forth. And when you're on the frontier, when you're, when you're trying to describe that which we do not yet understand, and the discoveries are relatively new, then, and you rise to the challenge, then the show can take on a whole other um, role on the, the landscape of science education. And so I just want to sort of uh, tip my hat to the team and others not up here who sweated mightily over making these visuals uh, come to life. Uh, Mordecai, uh, what's your trade-off between something you know has got to be in the show mm -hmm. and something that is just not interesting or compelling, but you got to put it in to tell the story? Where, where do you put that? Where, where's the line in the sand for that? We always want to have some, every scene has to be compelling. So if visually, we, visually. visually and also intellectually. And so every time we have some, a concept that needs to go in, we think about how are we going to do that. And perhaps the classic example is the topic of big bang nucleosynthesis. That means that the universe was once hotter than the center of the sun and there were nuclear reactions, fusion reactions going on everywhere, here, there, everywhere. How do we show that in a show? Well, the measurement that convinced most cosmologists was gas clouds against distant quasars three quarters of the way across the universe. That would have been very difficult to visualize. The other measurement that came at the same time was NASA dropped a probe into the giant planet Jupiter and, so, and measured how much of the, one of the atoms forged in the Big Bang, called deuterium, was in the atmosphere of Jupiter, where it had been preserved for the entire life of the solar system. That's pretty dramatic. So you handpick, of the many ways, sources of data, of information, you pick the one, because we know we can drop into Jupiter's atmosphere. We got that. Plus, well. that, <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit of work, well, but yeah, it, it ended up pretty good. Plus, uh, it's one of your research specialties is understanding what happens when things when you go into an atmosphere of a planet. That's actually true. Although I dropped rather bigger rocks in that little probe, I was uh, one of the people who simulated. And you actually dropped dropped the rocks. <laughs> I simulated, simulated dropping yes. off. Yes. The, uh, Sometimes he thinks 
what he does on the computer yeah, is he's yeah. doing it's it in reality. It's not reality. It's just a simulation. But it was a simulation of the impact of Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter. Um, and in fact, we show one of those simulations here in the planetarium. But it was also used to predict what would happen so that telescopes around the world could observe that event. Uh, before we go and to see if there's any issue. questions from the press, uh, Robert, just another, another question here. Is there a, uh, when I think of music, I think of you're manipulating emotion. So is it fair for you to take emotion to a place because you have the power to do so, even if what's going on in front of the viewer doesn't warrant it? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. I, I, believe, I believe it's fair only in the sense that um, I'm, as a composer, my job is to personalize the, the experience. And there is no way to personalize it and, and to distance yourself from, from a personal reaction. So I believe that it's, it's, um, it's okay to either disagree or feel differently about something, but I, I do believe that, that you want from a composer the, the commitment to, um, to what I honestly felt when I saw something. And in the case, we're talking about the, the Jupiter, Jupiter scene in, in this show. Is it just about this incredible um, technological uh, you know, innovation by all of us floating to the surface of the planet, or is it something really exciting? And to me, you know, that, that idea is it's really exciting. So it's honest for me, and I think it's fair for me to interject that. So I just realized that if you ever see a, a project that has a soundtrack and you're bored by it, we could all just blame the composer. You could. <laughs> <laughs> just just but if it's, of another scapegoat here. But by the same token, if you really all love it, you can also, you can also uh, thank the score. Take right? it to an, a, a, another place. Uh, there are questions we have uh, from anyone in the press. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking here. Uh, yes, we want to get a microphone to you. Uh, Roberto is coming around. Please identify yourself and what press outlet you, you represent. Hi, I'm Kyle McCarthy with Family Travel Forum. And I just have a question. You talked about um, addressing the dummies in the audience or the lay people. And then how do you go another level so that children who are watching the show understand? Well, that's a great question. And um, it's certainly one of the challenges. So our shows... By the way, it's a challenge for everything we do at this museum. We have to ask, what is the target audience and what is the width of age that that product can serve. So it wouldn't ever just be for the space show that we hit this question. So go ahead, Vivian. Right, and I think even more than um, just a target audience, because we don't really want to limit our content that way, we like our, our content to work in layers. So a very sophisticated astrophysicist who comes to see this show, I think, will get an awful lot of information than a 10-year-old will get. They will see the astrophysical data. They will understand the nature of that data and the truth of that data. And they will appreciate that aspect of the show. Whereas um, more general audiences will get a story. Um, kids may get the excitement. They'll get big ideas. They may not get every idea. Um, but hopefully we've built the content such that there is some scaffolding there that they can, they can build an understanding of over the course of the show. We also have a pre-show that I think that stars a young girl that's playing on some of these screens um, that I think will help prepare audiences um, and especially children for what they're going to see in the dome. And you'll see um, that playing upstairs, I believe. Um, and we also produce an educator's guide and a family guide that can be distributed to families and to educators that um, go into the main ideas of the show in a way that can prepare people. Um, either before they see the show or help them understand and go deeper after the show. Yeah, if I can add like further emphasis to this, the, one of the mission statements of the institution, well, one of the ways the institution has manifested itself, and I've remembered this since being a child coming here uh, at age nine and onward, there's any kid can get something out of every exhibit. Something. And then that's enough to stimulate interest and you come back another time and you get a little more and then a little more and a little more. And that's the layering that we were talking about. If, you're, if your barrier to entry is very high, then if you're below that level, you get nothing from the exhibit. And what's the point? So, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a balance of how you layer that information in ways that offends neither the bottom end or the upper end intellectually. 
And hopefully it'll be inspirational to everybody. Did you have a quick addendum there? Okay, sure. Uh, any other questions from, okay, over there? It's coming up. Hi there. So Dave Brody from space.com. Uh, I'm gonna hang this question on Tim Ferriss, but please other panelists feel free to, to answer. Creation of the universe, whole shebang, dark universe. You seem to have to keep rewriting the natural history of the universe. So my question is, how do you think of yourself? Are you a reporter? Are you guys reporters working at a time scale much slower than the rest of us media hacks? Or are you bards and poets on behalf of the scientists who don't have that voice? Are you illuminators for the endless procession of fifth graders that go through the dome? How do you think of yourselves? Thank you. Well, that, those all Plus there's a hidden plug nice. for one of Tim's books. The whole shebang is actually one of Tim's books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, those all sound kind of appealing. Uh, I can't say I've, I've, I've thought very much about how to describe myself. I, I've just always uh, interested in the most compelling and significant stories that uh, that I can out of which I can make a piece of writing, and that has not been entirely cosmology, but I, but it's such an amazing period that I keep returning to cosmology. And as you suggest, um, if you, it's a subject that if you, if, if you just come back after a decade, there'll be so many astonishing, many of the things that are in this show were simply unknown uh, 15, 20 years ago. So you do, in a sense, have to keep updating, although it's, it's not that the old stuff is wrong, it's that new... It's like the relationship between uh, Bach and Beethoven, you know, it's that something new has been done uh, on the basis of something that was already very credible. I'd like on to add hand, that it's... Uh, oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, in some sense, a participant observer, because I'm a research scientist, I'm working in the field, so what I'm bringing out here is, hey, what's really exciting that's going on now? And in some sense, that's what guides me and my fellow astrophysics curators when we're focusing in on, well, what should a space show be about? It's what are the really deep and significant advances in the field recently? Yeah, all true. But at the, <laughs> at, at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, our task at the Hayden Planetarium is to blow your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the, just to talk about some of the data and when we opened with Passport to the Universe, when we started the 10 production... 10 years ago, 12 years ago. Was, yeah, so 13 years ago, I guess. Yep, yep. So anyway, we, when we started, we had, we had 3,000 galaxies. That was it. In the data set. In the data set. Brand In the three-dimensional data set. Data set of galaxies going out to like the Virgo cluster. Uh, in, that, in, the, in the time since, we've had these large surveys come in, we've got about two million galaxies now, and that's, that's a huge testament to the technology and computational resource and our ability to design the instruments computationally and gather the data, process it, and visualize it and put it upstairs. But that's a very tiny percentage. You take the Hubble Deep Field and you extrapolate across the visible universe we can see, we get several hundred billion galaxies. So we're there's still a lot of work to do, but we attempt to bring that data to you, and it's, it's, it's got difficulties in the sense that we've looked here and there, but we haven't looked over here. And we, we, we don't shy away from that in this production. And you can't, because that's the extent of our knowledge now. Again, come back in a few decades and we have more. But so we keep that gaps. data set updated and alive. Yeah. There are gaps in the distribution of known galaxies, and you will see them on the dome because there are stripes and artifacts because here lie dragons. This has not yet been mapped. There are probably not dragons there, but you... <laughs> are you sure, Neil? <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Uh, but what, what Mordecai is saying is there are sections of where we project the data where there's data there but not there. And that's because the telescopes are located in spots on the Earth or directed to positions on the sky that are not all sky surveys. And when that's the case, we got to do the best with what we have. And so we're quite honest about the display of that. Let us bring this to a close. I want to thank the internet audience for joining us in this panel. And we've been seeing the, the Twitter stream that has resulted from us, from it, with the hashtag dark universe. 
Uh, let's give our panel a, a round of applause. Thank you all.